Today, MACV SOGs ground operators are celebrated for the bravery and military skills they displayed while conducting daring top secret missions behind enemy lines. On October the 18th, 1966, SOG conducted its first prisoner of war rescue operation, and it provided a wealth of lessons learned. Being a member of a combat unit that provides valuable lessons learned is military speak for a good way to get killed. Perhaps as interesting as the raid itself is a not often told story of the men they went to rescue and the ultimate connection to anti-war activist Jane Fonda and her husband, Tom Hayden. I met Major Frank Jacks at FOB1 in May of 1968 when I first arrived in Vietnam. Fifteen months later, I went to work for him at Command and Control Central. On the night of 25 to 26 October 1969, Jacks and I, along with a few others, including Colonel App, the camp commander, were sitting in the operations room staring at the mostly silent radios. Earlier that day, we had inserted a hatchet force into Laos, just north of the Cambodian border. The mission had gone terribly wrong from the start. Ambushed on the LZ, the unit fought to take the high ground some 400 meters away and formed a defensive perimeter. In the process, their platoon leader and a sergeant had been killed. Surrounded and greatly outnumbered, the remainder of the unit was in a dire situation. Jax had requested permission to extract the platoon in the morning by dropping concentrated tear gas on the enemy positions. We were waiting for President Nixon's approval. Perhaps because there was nothing else to do, Jax, a native Czechoslovakian, started to tell me in his thick Slavic accent about a POW rescue operation he had run for SOG three years earlier. In early September of 1966, a 17-year-old Viet Cong walked into the small U.S.-controlled airbase at Sok Trang, about 100 miles south-southwest of Saigon, and surrendered. During his debriefing, he stated that a black American soldier was being held captive in a Viet Cong compound less than a day's walk from the airbase. By the end of September, the information made its way to the newly formed Joint Personnel Recovery Center, which was charged with rescuing downed pilots. It was anticipated that these operations would occur in Vietnam and Laos, and since the only ground combat unit authorized to operate in Laos belonged to MACV SOG, the JPRC was placed under their command. It was determined that the American could be a Special Forces sergeant captured in July of 1964, or an Air Force captain whose plane had crashed in June of 1965. The next step was to find the compound. For days, RF-4 photo recon planes, unarmed F-4 fighters with cameras, overflew the area. Hampered by bad weather, they were unsuccessful. Finally, they sent a bird dog with an army photographer who took pictures out the window. From these, the Viet Cong defector identified the camp. It had been six weeks since he had last seen the American. At FOB2 Cantoon, then Captain Frank Jacks was ordered to ready his hatchet force company, made up of a hundred Nung mercenaries and a few American Special Forces soldiers. On the 18th of October, his force waited for transport on the runway. The Air Force, not realizing the urgency of the mission, diverted the planes for a cargo run, and the C-130s arrived three hours late. From Cantoon, they were flown 300 miles south to the base at Cantau. For the first time, Jax was briefed by personnel from the JPRC. He was told that there were no significant enemy troops within 10 miles of the compound that was guarded by 12 men. The main concern was that the guards would kill the American. In his typical blunt style, Jax told them that he didn't plan the mission, and since they would be landing a dozen helicopters near the compound, that decision would be made by the guards. They boarded the helicopters. At that point, he was interrupted as we were informed that the president had given his approval to employ gas to extract the endangered platoon. Jax had another rescue mission to run. To this day, I can hear the voice of the SPAD pilot over the radio as he prepared to drop the gas, announcing, rolling in to do the dirty deed. A couple of months later, I left Vietnam for the last time without ever hearing the end of Jack's story, and five months after that, I was separated from the Army. 
Since SOG was a top secret operation, we had all signed 20 year non disclosure statements, and like most of us, I never talked about it. Three decades later, my wife and I were browsing a bookstore, and I saw a red paperback with the large yellow letters SOG. For the next two days, I did nothing but read the book. My wife became curious, so I opened a box I had been dragging around for years and told her about the secret war in Laos. Plaster, who I learned arrived in SOG about the time I left, documented the entirety of SOG's operations. Early in the book, I read about Operation Crimson Tide, and for the first time, I learned what happened on Major Jax's mission. After loading the helicopters, the company made the quick 20-minute flight to the target area. As the lead ships were setting down on the LZ, the four helicopters carrying the 3rd platoon, perhaps sensing that the LZ was too small, but more likely improperly briefed, diverted to an adjacent open area across the small canal, directly in front of the compound, splitting the force. It was a fatal decision. They were immediately engaged by a much stronger enemy force than had been anticipated. One helicopter was shot down, and the hatchet force platoon leader was killed. The helicopter crew was quickly placed aboard another ship. As the platoon struggled to find cover, the remaining helicopters departed. On the LZ, Jax, with two platoons, was pinned down. Without a forward air controller, he worked through a radio relay to get air support. Mortars began falling on the third platoon. Finally, the air support arrived, but instead of the low and slow flying A1E Sky Raiders that provided excellent close air support that Jax expected, the Air Force sent two F 100 Super Saber jets. Flying at high speed under heavy cloud cover, the fighters struggled with target acquisition. The men on the LZ could only watch in horror as a bomb was dropped in front of the compound devastating the 3rd platoon. Attempts to cross the canal to go to their aid were repulsed by heavy enemy fire. With the mission hours behind schedule, light was fading fast. By the time it was dark, exchanges of gunfire became sporadic. The enemy, which were later determined to be at least two Viet Cong main force battalions that were using the compound as a rest stop, did what the Viet Cong did best and disappeared into the darkness. At first, Lake Jax moved his platoon across the canal and tended to the wounded. Both Americans and 11 Nungs had been killed. 17 Nungs were missing, perhaps as a result of the errant bombing. Needless to say, no American POWs were rescued that day. What was left of the hatchet force returned to Cantoon, and the JPRC went about compiling a list of lessons learned. By the time Captain Jax received his mission orders, the JPRC suspected the POW in the compound was Captain Carl Edwin Jackson. Jackson was the pilot of a C-123 that had flown out of Natrang on the night of 27 June 1965 and crashed somewhere southwest of Saigon. Now that could easily be the end of the story, but it certainly isn't. On the plane besides Jackson was an American loadmaster, a Chinese co-pilot, and 14 Chinese nationals. The C-123 had no standard markings or tail number and was painted in a unique black and green camouflage pattern. Called a Blackbird, it belonged to the 1131st Special Activities Squadron, which was assigned to MACV SOG. It may have been wishful thinking, but the JPRC thought they could be going after one of their own. As it turns out, it would be determined that Jackson had been killed in the crash Unfortunately, due to the classified nature of the Special Activities Squadron, his family thought they were being given the runaround about his death. At times, it's very hard not knowing because I don't have that closure, his son Alan Jackson said. His commanding officer has given us three different stories and they contradict each other. This situation was all too well known by the families of SOG's ground operators who went missing during top secret missions in Laos or Cambodia. Master Sergeant Robert Edward Johnson, a 20-year Army veteran, was assigned as an advisor to the South Vietnamese Army in January 1964. On July 21st of that year, he was captured west of Sok Trang and taken to a Viet Cong prisoner of war camp in the Yu Minh Forest, 
where he would join eight other Americans, including Lieutenant Nick Rowe, who would famously escape in December 1968 and recount his experiences in the book Five Years to Freedom. The Yuman Forest is not a forest. It's a remote, inhospitable marsh that had been used by smugglers and pirates for centuries. As recounted by Rowe, the prisoners, plagued by disease, were constantly moved around and often separated. With the testimony from Rowe and the proximity of the targeted compound, we can say with more certainty today that the American identified by the defector, who passed numerous polygraphs, was in fact Master Sergeant Johnson. The following summer of 1967, 158 riots erupted in urban communities across America. Sparked by police hostility towards black citizens, the mass of social unrest, alternately labeled riots and rebellions by the world press, resulted in 83 deaths and 17,000 arrests. In a move that the CIA called designated for maximum propaganda impact, the Viet Cong seized the opportunity to show their humane and lenient treatment of Americans, especially black Americans. In a Veterans Day ceremony on November 11, 1967, in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, three American POWs, including Johnson, were turned over to peace activist Tom Hayden, then-husband of Jane Fonda, and returned to the States. After a short stay in the hospital, Johnson returned to active duty until he retired as a first sergeant on 1 March 1974. He passed away in July of 2000 at the age of 77. There is no evidence to suggest Johnson ever learned of the sacrifice the SOG commandos made in their attempt to rescue him. You'll find my book Dawson's War worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac V. SOG's operations, Dawson's War is a story of five men, three Americans and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But SOG was so much more than gunfights. SOG was a brotherhood. And unless you experience the camaraderie these men shared, you really don't know SOG. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends. And like I do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer SOG's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks. And as always, like and subscribe. It helps.